I mean, the reality of residency selection is that you know, there's always going to be winners and there's going to be losers. There's going to be people who are thrilled on match day and people who are not so happy, you know, or even devastated. There's always going to be winners and losers. The question is, how do we, how do we decide who wins and loses? Hello, everyone. I am excited because we have a fantastic guest, Dr. Brian Carmody. I'm just going to give you an opportunity to tell us a little about yourself and your journey to medicine. Hey, it's, uh, it's nice to be here. Um, I guess, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of a dying breed. I feel like these days I, I went straight from college into medical school and, and didn't ever do anything else. I, you know, I went to college with the idea of being a pre-med and kind of stuck with that. So I think, especially compared to the students that I meet these days, I had a much more sort of traditional and boring, you know, path to, um, to getting to where I am today. That was me too. And I love to tell students like there are us that are, are very traditional. I was like, okay, I, I since I was a little girl or a little boy, I, I wanted to be a doctor and I kind of went in that way. Yeah. But there are also opportunities for those who may be discouraged just to know that there are many paths to medicine. So there are people who go into college and Right now, it's, it's very uh, common where you're not a science major. I was a biology major, which was also kind of traditional. I wish I'd honestly done something different, like something in the humanities or something. But here we are. But there are so many different avenues to becoming a physician. And now with the way that medicine is going, I always tell students that if being a doctor is what you want to do, go for it. But if there's anything you want to try before then, it's okay to try something else and then come back. Right. So you are a pediatrician. Can you tell us what made you choose that field? When I went to medical school, if you'd seen me at really at any point in medical school up to really the time that I put in my residency applications, I would have told you I was going to be an internist. That's what a doctor was to me. And it was an internal medicine physician. That's who my role models were. And that was the, the goal that I was very laser focused on really until I kind of had some experiences in the um, end of third year and the beginning of fourth year medical school, where I really realized that a lot of the things that I liked about internal medicine also applied to pediatrics, you know, the opportunity to specialize and, you know, learn a field in, in great depth and and it's fun to work with kids and it's fun to work with people who like to work with kids and, and it makes for a pleasant, you know, day-to-day -day experience. And uh, so I, I kind of changed tracks um, actually right around the time that applications were due in fourth year. And I think it was, uh, I think it was a good decision for me. I love that story because a lot of people who enter medical school sometimes come kind of like tunnel vision on what they think they want to do. And you'll go through your different processes and rotations during school and you'll see all of the different things and, and you may find that you love something else. So I will always tell people to go into each rotation with an open mind because you may discover a love for a field that you had never imagined. I personally, I am a family physician. So when I went into medical school, I always thought primary care, but I hadn't necessarily knew many family doctors. So I also was thinking about internal, then med peds and all of those kinds of things. And I, of course, found family, which was kind of like a blend of both. But just keeping your mind open is so important. Yeah. The only thing I'll add to that is that like when you when you get a feeling that something may be for you, I mean, um, I wouldn't try to talk yourself out of it. You know, for, for me, I'll tell you what the very thing was, uh, sort of the turning point. You know, I liked my pediatrics rotation. I still didn't think I was going to do it. I did my acting internship, you know, advanced electives and things in, in internal medicine. And, um, and I liked it. There really wasn't anything I didn't like about it. But then I was doing a pediatric ER rotation. And, um, you know, back in those days, it, it was, you know, sort of pre EMR era. So when there was a new patient ready to be seen, the charge nurse would come over with this rigid clipboard and drop it into this meta metal, you know, rack. And she would drop it in such a way that it made like a, a real loud clatter so that all the residents in the workroom would, you know, turn and look and, you know, realize there was a patient that was ready to be seen. And, uh, you know, one day I was reflecting on how you know, when I was on my medicine rotation and my, and my pager went off, you know, on those advanced electives, my initial re reaction was always sort of like, ah, you know, even though, I mean, I was happy to see the patients and learn new things. But when I heard that clatter of the clipboard, I mean, I was, I, my, my response was excitement. And I, and I really kind of 
the more I thought about it, I was like, there's, there's something to that. I should listen to that, that feeling that I've got. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in doing things, you know, by feel like that. And, and I think that ended up, like I said, being a very, you know, a blessing to me that I listened to it. I love that because you have to kind of, one of my mentors when I was in medical school told me that like, you kind of just know you got to find your people. So you can enjoy doing different things and you have to kind of put your best foot forward and learn because a lot of the rotations that you'll be in in medical school are the last time you'll ever see something. So if you, for instance, go into primary care and you're trying to think through, OK, this is what happens with a surgery. This is how I do the pre-op evaluation or whatever. Or if you're a surgeon and you're thinking about like the different steps in terms of like medication management for hypertension, you you the last time you'll get an intensive experience will be on certain rotations. But when you kind of find your people and you're excited to get up and and go to work every day, I think you kind of, kind of listen to that. Right. Exactly. So we have had a lot of different deans and residency directors, program directors on our show and matching into residency is becoming more and more competitive. You recently discuss the USMLE scope creep. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I guess I should say, you know, I don't, I'm not somebody who has a big title or anything. I'm not a dean or an admissions director or um, you know, anything like that. But I, I am somebody who follows this stuff pretty closely, you know, in terms of residency selection and issues related to the USMLE. And so to whatever extent I'm known as anything other than a pediatric nephrologist, it's usually for those things. So, so yeah, you know, if you look at USMLE scores, and you go back to the beginning of the test in the early 1990s, you know, they came up with a scaled score where the mean score was 200. And um, these days, um, you know, USMLE just released the data from the last um, you know, testing cycle. You know, the median score now is up to about 250. So it's increased 50 points. And, um, you know, if you don't have a sense, I mean, if you're a pre-med and you don't have a sense on uh, of sort of what the, the, the scale of that, you know, has, change has been, you know, it means that the worst test takers today on USMLE Step 2CK, they do better than the, the, the average test taker did in the 1990s. And the, the very best test takers in the 1990s are about average today. I mean, that's, that's how much better students are, um, are scoring on the test. And, and so there's a lot of, you know, I mean, many people recognize that this is occurring, but I think sometimes there's some misinformation about what's driving that trend. And so, you know, not long ago, you're right, I put out a video on YouTube to discuss and sort of break down those things. But, you know, I don't, I, it's easy to look at it and see that, you know, oh, wow, people are scoring higher. I mean, that's, that's a good thing. And in a certain way, it is. But in a certain way, it's not either. You know, I mean, it's a little bit troubling that that this is occurring and especially occurring at the um, at the pace that it is. I agree. And it brings up a lot of speculations, to be honest, for full disclosure, for those listeners out there. I haven't necessarily looked very deeply into the scoring systems now, but we are seeing that scores are higher and it is becoming more competitive. And I I don't know if that's because people are scoring higher on the MCATs and needing to get in or they're just better test takers or they have better tools in place in order to help people navigate taking standardized tests with a lot of the question banks and things that are come forward. But it does leave questions in terms of what types of factors are going into that? How are students studying? How is it affecting where they match? Is the match becoming a little more competitive because of that? I know that they have made changes to the USMLE exams in terms of step one going to pass fail. But now does that put more pressure on people to do extremely better on the step twos? So it kind of leaves a lot of questions in terms of what emphasis we're placing on standardized tests in medicine and also how does that correlate clinically to the types of physicians that we're putting into the workforce? Yeah, right. I, I agree with those things. I mean, in terms of what's driving the trend, I mean, you, you hit several things. I think there's a greater familiarity with standardized tests when students enter medical school than students, you know, 30 years ago. Students today certainly have access to more efficient study resources that are specifically geared you know, to teach to the test and help um, correctly analyze these multiple choice questions. But of course, the other thing is that students are under greater pressure to score highly. 
um, you know, to succeed in residency selection. And the funny thing about residency selection is that, um, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. There's certainly a broad perception that residency selection is getting more and more competitive. And by many metrics, it absolutely is. But the funny thing about that is that, that by the, if you look at the macroeconomics of the match, the number of applicants and the number of positions, it's actually more favorable now than it has been in recent memory, maybe even ever. So, you know, this past year, you know, we had like 1.9 residency positions available for every graduating USMD student. And if you add in USDO students as well, there's still 1.38 residency positions available. You know, so there's, there's more than enough for everyone among those two groups. And then, of course, when, when you have international medical graduates and students from other parts of the world and so on, um, then there's more position, there's more applicants than there are positions. Um, but the issue is that it's sort of at every stratum of, of the, the universe of residency programs, there's more people that want that thing than there are of that thing. And that's really the challenge is that at every level, whether you're talking about, um, you know, community based family medicine programs or academic otolaryngology programs, there's more people that want that than than there are of that that thing. And so, you know, students primary focus is to, you know, to distinguish themselves relative to their to their competition. And that's, a, you know, that's a, a challenging place to be, I think, as a student. Absolutely. And for the listeners out there who may have not entered medical school yet and may not be familiar with the match, it's kind of a process where you go through your first preclinical years and you take your step one, which we were talking about the USMLE, and then you go and that is pass fail. Then you go into your clinical years. And after that, you take step two, which is broken up into two parts, the skills part, which is kind of an in-person patient engagement test, as well as the knowledge test, where you do more questions similar to what you would do in the step one or your MCAT and things like that based on specific uh, fields in terms of medicine. And then after that, you put in more applications, you go and you interview for residency, and you enter what is called the match process. So it's a little different than when you were trying to apply to medical school because, yes, the schools have to match you and it's supposed to be favorable for the applicants. But there's a big little draft process and you kind of find out on match day where you end up for the next three to seven years. Yay, like Oprah. So (laughs) it's a very interesting process in terms of picking a job. And sometimes students will say they want to go into emergency medicine. They'll find 20 programs or however many programs they apply to. They get, say, 15 interviews. They rank them in the order in which they want to go. The other schools would rank them as well. And the computers do their little magic and they'll say, "Okay, you got into your number one spot or you got into your number three spot. You have to go there. But sometimes you don't get into any spot. So sometimes people will pick uh, other specialties that they would enjoy going to an interview with them as well. Say they want to be an orthopedic surgeon. They may interview at a lot of programs, but also put some internal medicine. But it's a complicated process, as it probably sounds very confusing with me describing. But sometimes, even despite going through medical school, passing all of your exams and things like that, you may graduate without a residency position. So it, it's something that a lot of programs are looking into and they're trying to fund more residency slots. But as was mentioned, there are spots there. It's just kind of how do you navigate getting to that? Right. Yeah, it, uh, I guess I can't resist putting in a plug for anybody who's listening, who, who wants to know more about the match. I have sort of an exhaustive, I think it's a six part history of the match on YouTube where I go through uh, how the algorithm works and how we ended up with this sort of unusual system and why it's persisted and how it's strengthened um, you know, over time. I love that. We'll definitely, if you can uh, share it after this, we can put it in the show notes yeah. and perhaps closer to the match, we can invite you back to chat about it. <laughs> Uh, right. The match is usually in March. Uh, so maybe you'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy. To. And my, my other question for you is we, we talked about matching and things like that. Sometimes uh, people decide to subspecialize like you are a pediatric nephrologist. So there's right. also a pediatric subspecialty shortage. Do you think that the reasons are similar or are there other reasons for that? You're right. So in, if you want to become a pediatric specialist, you do a residency in pediatrics and then you do a fellowship and there's a separate matching process these days for almost all those fellowships. That match actually happened um, last week 
And so many specialties in pediatrics fill almost all their positions. You know, this year, pediatric hospital medicine filled almost all their positions and pediatric cardiology almost always does and neonatology and critical care medicine and even gastroenterology had a little bit of a down year, but still fills almost all of its positions. But then there's a number of specialties in pediatrics that, that don't fill all their positions. So nephrology is one of them, typically fills about 50% of its positions. Developmental and behavioral pediatrics and pediatric endocrinology and pediatric infectious disease and pediatric pulmonology. And so there is a concern that, you know, as, as the workforce in those specialties continues to age and retire, um, that we're not replacing them rapidly enough. And, and so we're going to have to figure out a way to, um, to either inspire more people to pursue those careers or another care model for taking care of those kids, you know, who have those conditions because they're not going away regardless of how many people, you know, match or don't. That's definitely something to think about because now there, there's a physician shortage kind of booming in general. So a lot, there are a lot of different things that we're thinking about in terms of the next phase of the healthcare system, in terms of how do we structure a system that doesn't have enough physician experts to care for patients. So do they go into the model with more mid-levels taking care where supervisory roles, or sometimes in some states they don't have supervisory roles with mid-levels. And then other things like automating things using machine learning and AI. So it'll be very interesting as you guys enter the healthcare system to see what we evolve into. Yeah, right. So we've learned so many things um, during this session, and I'm going to try to close with one of my questions that I love to ask. If there's anything you could change about the medical education system, if you had a magic wand, what would that be? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. And I, uh, um, and I guess I should say I spend kind of a lot of time thinking about questions like that. To me, uh, the, the fundamental problem is that you know, everybody's working hard, but everybody's got slightly different incentives. And I wish that we could align the incentives of the system. So, so that everybody's pulling in the same direction. I mean, what I mean is, you know, I see, I see medical students working so hard, I mean, you know, cause as I said, they've got to distinguish themselves relative to their competitors when they're, you know, seeking residency positions at competitive programs or in selective disciplines. I see them working so hard, you know, um, on USMLE and, um, you know, research and other things. And, and I mean, there's some benefit in them doing that, but, at the same time, quite a bit of that stuff does not or will not ever benefit patients, you know? And I wish that we could, I wish we could select residents based on the criteria that we, we actually care about, you know, the skills and, you know, and qualities that we, that we truly care about. Because then, I mean, the reality of residency selection is that you know, there's always going to be winners and there's going to be losers. There's going to be people who are thrilled on match day and people who are not so happy, you know, or even devastated. There's always going to be winners and losers. The question is, how do we, how do we decide who wins and loses? And society as a whole will benefit if we use the right things and, you know, patients and society and programs won't if we use the wrong. So I see this, this incredible amount of, of energy that's being spent, you know, on the, the applicant side, on the program side. You know, and, and I guess actually you can extend this further, you know, to the healthcare system as a whole. You know, we have, we have lots of people working very hard in lots of different ways on different sides of things. Um, but they have different incentives, which shades the decisions that they make. And so if you could harness that injury, that all that energy and, and have everybody pulling in the same direction, if you could align the incentives so that, that people are working hard to achieve the things that we truly care about, we'd have a system that benefits everybody. I couldn't agree more. I definitely appreciate you for joining and sharing your words of wisdom with our audience. I want to give you an opportunity to say goodbye as well as let the listeners know where they can find you. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, uh, well, I, I go by the Sheriff of Sodium. So <laughs> if you uh, if you go to, uh, I have a, a site where I post content from time to time, uh, which is thesheriffofsodium.com. Lately, I've been working to try to make some durable content in video form. So you know, the Sheriff of Sodium YouTube channel is the place to find that. I'm still on X at, at JB Carmody, J-B-C-A-R-M-O-D-Y. I'm not sure that I'll stay there. I've, I've um, started on threads and other places as well to sort of be able to comment on things. Um, 
you know, as they're occurring. But yeah, it was a pleasure to, um, to talk with you today. Um, you know, I, I, I love thinking about and talking about, um, you know, all the things related to, you know, medical education and residency selection. That's sort of, you know, my, my wheelhouse. Um, I'm always eager for the opportunity to, um, to discuss it anywhere. Thank you so much. And for the audience out there, definitely share this with your friends. Even if you have not gotten to the part where you're thinking about where you're going to apply to residency and things like that yet. It's something to plan. So share the wealth. We're on YouTube now, so you can kind of watch us there or wherever else podcasts are found. And you can definitely reach out to me on my Instagram at Dr. D Graham, D-O-C-T-O-R, the letter D-G-R-A-M. And let me know what topics you want us to discuss or if there are any guests that you would like for us to invite back. Have a good day. Bye. Each episode of the Perspective Doctor podcast is brought to you by Med School Coach. To access articles, videos, webinars, and free tools to help you succeed on your journey toward med school and beyond, visit our website, perspectivedoctor.com. We hope you tune in again next time.